adopting a local goddess was the rule rather than the exception. So most of the time, when we look at goddesses in Indo-European religions, we're not looking at Indo-European goddesses. We're looking at goddesses that were there before the Indo-Europeans and which were incorporated into. That's interesting. It might reflect what I talked about earlier, their patriarchal attitudes and how they would come into an area and just take the women for themselves. Welcome to the Cosmic Keys Podcast. This is going to be your episode for the week of March 22nd, 2021 to March 28th, 2021. And on today's show, I have a really great conversation with Tom Rousel, who is the creator of the YouTube channel Survive the Jive, which is a channel that's been around for a few years now that covers really in-depth study of European paganism, European history, Western history, and I have a really great chat with Tom where I talk a lot about really ancient history and groups of tribes and um, ancient ancestors of the Europeans. Lots of nitty gritty things um, that I get to ask Tom after watching a lot of his videos over the years. And we also go into Tom's views and practice of modern paganism and great, great stuff. You're not going to want to miss it. Um, Survive the Jive has been, you know, out there for a while. It's a really prolific, large channel. So I was really honored to get to talk to Tom and pick his brain. So yeah, Tom is the second YouTuber I've had on in a row with Dr. Justin Sledge on last episode and it's really i'm really glad to be talking to people who put out really good historically accurate um documentaries on youtube because yeah we've been kind of lagging for a while the discovery channel and the history channel have not been delivering for the past five or so years a la ancient aliens slash ice road truckers slash what is the other one? Like Pawn Stars? Anyways, um, definitely check out Survive the Jive, the YouTube channel. Um, so if you want to skip forward straight to the interview, as with every episode, um, I put the timestamps in the show notes. Listen to the listen for the music if you're ever just like, I don't want to hear this astrology forecast. And I will say that um, I've, you know, I'm always talking to you guys about how I'm considering making these changes to my format or making these changes to my Patreon, blah, 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 blah. Well, I, I, I am thinking about that again. I'll just put that out there. I'm considering making the astrological forecast a Patreon only feature. If, if anyone um, would like to give me feedback I would really appreciate it because the show has gone through a lot of changes and I'm sure my audience demographics have changed. I really don't know if people skip straight to the interview very often or if they sit and listen to the astrology section very often. And I am considering like really making myself a better forecaster by making the forecast section its own weekly Patreon only show. If anyone has any grievances with that, let me know. I'm just, you know, I see the numbers. The numbers are going up. The listenership is going up. But um, I kind of worry that because the show isn't strictly about astrology, I hope I'm not like scaring people away with the intro about astrology or making people switch the channel very quickly because of the astrology. So let me know what you would think if you would like to have a better, like, separate feed or separate download that's only the forecast that's out on maybe a Sunday as opposed to like a Wednesday right now because um, not only has my the schedule has been much more sporadic in releasing the shows but also now I have a new job that has a new weekend so my weekend is now Monday Tuesday and it's it's going to be harder to like get the shows out with these forecasts to be relevant for the week ahead. And I also want to put the time and effort into like 
giving a better delivery of the forecast because I'm kind of watching other astrologers out there talk and I'm kind of like, how do I refine this presentation of the astrology? Basically, since this is coming out on a, on a Thursday, I will go over the next few days. We do have some stuff coming up right now. So we are in Aries season, as we know. Uh, the sun moved into Aries on the spring equinox last Saturday, the 20th. So we're getting into the beginning of Aries season. Um, so keep in mind the ruler of Aries is the warrior planet Mars. And this is definitely a Martian week again. Um, the sun is also exalted in Aries. So think about the solar energy and the Mars energy really coming through with this like burst forward, this spring forward energy. Um, so Thursday, March 25th, um, we have the moon in Leo at the beginning of the day. And then the moon later moves into Virgo at 11 25 PM Eastern time. Before that, um, we have Mercury squaring the nodes. Mercury squared Mars on Tuesday. So it's separating from its square from Mars. So, you know, the communication with Mercury square Mars is combative, intense, aggressive, could lead to like foot in mouth syndrome or just saying things very um, abruptly in a kind of Martian way. So that energy is separating Mercury being in Pisces and Mars being in Gemini. That forms a 90 degree square, a tense angle between the planet of communication and Mars. That happened on Tuesday. And then on Thursday, Mercury is squaring with the North Node. So that brings kind of similar energy and intensity to your communication. Um, it's squaring the nodes because Mars is approaching its conjunction with the nodes. So the nodes are the two points where the eclipse points happen they're on the opposite ends of the zodiac wheel this year they are at the gemini sagittarius axis so mercury is squaring the node and then on sunday mars will conjunct the node so at, from thursday to sunday the martian energy is being driven in a very energized way the north node is the head of the dragon that is Rahu in Vedic astrology. So the head of the dragon is kind of what's endlessly hungry. And the tail of the dragon, which is Ketu, the south node, is what's depleting. It's sort of just like trailing off and um, it's like a drain almost. So with Mars, the warrior planet, the warrior energy approaching this point of this uh, Rahu north node point in Gemini, it's going to just, you know, make all that grow uh, and kind of climax on Sunday. And Sunday this week is the full moon in Libra too. So we'll get there. But before we get there, um, just to finish out Thursday, like I said, the moon will be in Leo in the uh, throughout the day. It is opposite Jupiter in the morning at 9.27 a.m. It opposes Jupiter in Aquarius. So I'd say the energy of Thursday, um, do the Virgo things, do the organizational things. Your morning might have a very kind of um, expansive, optimistic attitude with that uh, moon opposite Jupiter. And then later at night, uh, moon enters Virgo. So that's when you want to start thinking in the Virgo mindset. Friday, we have... Um, like I said, moon moving through the earth sign of Virgo. It trines Uranus in the morning and then squares Mars at night. So, uh, yeah, because Uranus is in the earth sign of Taurus, anytime we have things moving through Virgo, they're trining uh, Uranus. So the moon trining Uranus can bring kind of like a little spark in your afternoon on Friday. And speaking of spark, um, to kind of backtrack on Friday, Friday morning at 2.57 a.m. is the Kazemi of Venus and the sun. So this is like the a new beginning in Venus's sonotic cycle. Um, this is basically like a new moon of the planet Venus. Venus is the morning star planet of love, relationships, beauty, harmony, money um 
So relationship wise, pay attention to your relationships on Thursday and Friday this week. Definitely consider, you know, if you're single, maybe sign up for a, a dating app very, you know, late Thursday or early Friday morning when Venus is in that heart of the sun. Uh, the Kazemi point is the point where Venus and the sun are at the same point in the sky. Um, so it's a good time for relationships. It's a good time of clarity in relationships. Um, Venus has been combust by the sun. So under the rays of the sun for a few weeks now, and this is the kind of time where the the burning rays of the sun are removed for a sec and Venus is in the heart of the sun and there's this clarity. She's there, like in the heart of the the heart space. <laughs> the sun is the sun and the sign of Leo are kind of related to the heart itself. And Venus is a planet associated with um, love and relationships. So think about relationships right now with that Kazemi happening in Aries. Um, yeah. So yeah, Thursday into Friday, we have the, like I said, moon in uh, Virgo. And then on Saturday, um, not a whole lot to mention. The moon will try and Pluto in the evening. So Pluto is in Capricorn. So the emotions that you're experiencing on Saturday evening will be kind of intense, but in a good way. Um, that's the way I see it when it comes to Pluto. And then moving on to Sunday, um, Sunday is the full moon day. And it's also, like I said, the day that the, that Mars conjuncts the North node. So, um, the moon enters Libra at one twenty two AM Eastern time on Sunday. Then Mars will make its conjunction with the North node at 5 13 a.m on sunday so i'm really seeing like the build up from um thursday to sunday as like a productive time mainly because like like i said mars is moving closer to the north node so you'll have that energy to drive yourself forward and do the things and fight for the things and in gemini it's going to be very cracked out um <laughs> communicative social like running back and forth delay delivering information to uh, from one person to the other just like putting yourself out there and with uh with the moon passing through virgo that whole time and interacting with first uranus and then then mars and then pluto you can really bring like an intense focus to the Virgo activities that that you need to get done this weekend. So this could be like a spring cleaning weekend. It could be just like an organizational weekend. Um, but you're going to have the, the, the fire of Mars to really do that. And then after that happens in the morning, in the mid afternoon, we have the actual full moon. So this full moon is interesting as well. It is happening at eight degrees of Libra. So the sun is at eight degrees Aries and the moon is at eight degrees Libra. That opposition causes a full moon. The sun is basically in a, a triple conjunction with Chiron, the wounded healer, the asteroid whom I don't really cover on this show, but it's there. So I'll say it. Chiron, the sun is, and Venus are all right next to each other. So those who are observant of Chiron, you know, think of the the symbolism of healing the wounded healer, or not healing the wounded healer, but playing the role of the wounded healer in relation to relationships. So this moon is opposite Venus. Venus is in her detriment in Aries. So, um, it's going to be an interesting moon. It's also kind of in a trine with Saturn. Saturn's at 11 degrees Aquarius, the air sign, and that's trining the moon there. And the node is kind of trining everything too at 14. So we get a little bit of a little bit of that Mars North node action. It is aligning by sign, by element, the air element. So we have a, ve- a loose 
loose trine between Saturn, the moon, Mars, and then the Mars North Node conjunction. And then we have the opposition of the moon with Sun, Chiron, and Venus. So that's kind of interesting. It's, um, it will be, you know, relationship focused because the moon is in the sign of the scales where the scales are about relationships. They're about balancing things out, finding harmony between opposing ideas. Um, but the ruler of this moon being Venus is in the sign of Aries, her sign of exile. So because she rules Libra, she's on the opposite end of the Zodiac there. Like, what am I doing here in Mars land? But that just brings out the spicy nature of Venus. It brings out a different version of Venus. And then if you consider Chiron there too, Chiron is the wounded healer. It might so this moon this full moon that's happening on Sunday, think about relationships, think about balance, think about the duality between individuality and partnership with with the sun in Aries. Aries represents individuality. It's me, me, me. It's nobody but myself and venus is or i'm sorry libra is you know let's find balance let's hang out i need you i need i need you to help me through this i need your support we need to do this together we need to find middle ground so think about that duality with this new moon and think about kind of the trine happening between mars moon and saturn in the air signs it's going to be a very airy airy and fiery energy as always is going on during these um equinox seasons you know spring is the airy season of fire fall is the um the airy season or no what am i saying the libra season of air um and it's really interesting just thinking about those times of years of when um the sun where the days and nights are equal for one day. And then from there on out, we're going, um, full force towards summer. Um, and then because I don't know when the next forecast will be happening. Um, we also have on Monday, the 29th, uh, Mercury is going to conjunct with Neptune and Pisces. So, that's a, a very like dreamy, creative day for your mind. Um, definitely try to do something creative or spiritual or otherworldly or disassociative, <laughs> something that can let your mind like go into the astral or the ethers. And yeah, that's going to do it for the astrology of this week. Um, like I said, I'm sitting here with two computer screens. I'm a little disoriented. I'm playing with my new Solar Fire app and trying to take it a little bit further, but it's kind of a work in progress. But like I said, let me know if you are an avid forecast listener. Let me know if to if honestly you just skip forward through the forecast and also let me know what you think about my idea of making all of basically all of my forecasting Patreon only. Um, because like I said, the show isn't strictly about astrology and the astrology section. I just hope it's not scaring people away from the content of this show that don't know about the show notes and don't know that they can fast forward through this section where I'm rambling. And I think if I, if I had a a Patreon only um, weekly forecast feed with definite listeners, I think I could really refine my presentation and get better at forecasting too. Um, Because like I said, I'm trying to take it beyond just listing out the transits every day and trying to really synthesize things. And when I look at this time period, I'm looking at, I, I really think like, Use the Mars energy to do the Virgo stuff and think about relationships. Think about this as a new beginning for a relationship and in a way a climax for relationship dynamics because like I said, the Venus Kazemi of the sun is happening on Friday and the full moon in Libra, Venus's sign, is happening on Saturday. 
and there's all this Martian action going on. So this is really um, these few days, I think, are are focused on the Mars Venus duality and dynamic. So with that being said, stay tuned for my interview with Tom Rousel of Survive the Jive, where we talk all about the Indo-Europeans, the ancient cultures of Europe, and ancient history of the West. So stay tuned. So today on the Cosmic Keys podcast, we are speaking with Tom Rousel, who's the creator of the YouTube channel Survive the Jive. And Survive the Jive is a great channel that I've been seeing on and off for a few years now through YouTube, which covers really the historical side of paganism, European paganism. It really covers the map in lots of different topics, and Tom does a great job in his presentation and his style. So I'm really excited to talk to Tom today all about European paganism, um, his personal pagan practice, and pick his brain a little bit on all the historical stuff that he has studied over the years. So welcome to the show, Tom. Thank you very much for having me, Dan. Yeah, so I, I'm really interested to start off to get a little bit of uh, your bio because you, you we, we catch glimpses of it watching your videos and stuff like that, but could you share a little bit about uh, your upbringing um, and kind of what led you towards creating this channel and studying all these topics that you study? Sure, I can. Well, I I'm an Englishman. I come from an area not that far from London, a rural area around London, which most all the counties surrounding London, the rural areas that we call the home counties. And um, I grew up in a quite normal middle class family. My grandfather and my grandmother on my father's side are both uh, Oxford history graduates. And my family is quite into myth and stuff. I was raised a Catholic, but my family is not Catholic. It's uh, high church Anglican, which is the kind of Anglican, what you call in America Episcopalians, but there's a a certain subsection of it that's so, that looks very much like Catholics. It even has Latin mass, but it isn't Catholic because it still holds the queen to be superior to the Pope. But uh, they went, sent me to Catholic school. So I was sort of raised Catholic in a non-Catholic household. Um, But I am... Uh, I was very interested in mythology from an early age. My teachers got me into Greek mythology at primary school and my family, my grandfather gave me books on Greek mythology, books on Russian mythology, all these different myth books. And I've always liked them, especially the Greek stuff, but I, uh, and Celtic stuff I liked as a child, but I, some of fairy tales, you know, that sort of thing. But then when I got older and I looked into uh, I wasn't so much into, I, I wasn't, hadn't been religious for a long time. I drifted away from the church and um, I start, but I still had certain spiritual experiences in my personal life that were uh, hard for me to explain with just my uh, rationalist, materialist, atheist perspective. So I sort of returned to some of these themes of ancient religions and looked more broadly than those I'd looked at as a child. So I started to look at Aztec stuff. I found that interesting and I took an interest in all kinds of different esoteric traditions and, you know, uh, the usual like sort of checking out Aleister Crowley and all that kind of stuff. But I uh, eventually settled on the idea that as an Englishman, I ought to look at the religion of the English. and so 
there's very little on that. And even Tolkien, the author of Lord of the Rings, who was an expert in, he was an Anglo, a professor of Anglo-Saxon studies at Oxford. He, um, he wrote Lord of the Rings partly, he says, as a way to reconstruct the lost mythology of the English because a little, very little of the Anglo-Saxon mythology survives. But what we do know of it is very much, it very much corresponds with the Norse mythology of Scandinavia. It's very closely related to that. So I went to, I had already been a, uh, a graduate in communications and media and working in media. I saved up all my money from my job in media uh, about uh, 10 years ago now and then went back to university to get a master's in medieval history when I focused on Nordic, Norse mythology and Anglo-Saxon literature so I could get a really better idea as Tolkien had on what the mythology of the English would look like and then I was at that time a pagan practicing but very hungry for knowledge and not just not really satisfied with what I could get from neo-pagans practicing neo-pagans I wanted to get some solid academic grounding um, on which to base my practice so that I would know that I wasn't just relying on my intuitions and my personal gnosis so uh, I proceeded from there and then I began um uh, I had originally intended to become a teacher after that and teach um, you know, about the, my, the history of um, the English to children, just as my grandfather had after he fought in the Second World War, he came back and became a teacher. But then I, um, I decided that I don't really much approve of the educational system as it is in the, uh, in the current times anyway. And I thought with my existing knowledge of media and my work in media, I was already well positioned to communicate directly with people via uh, film. So I got together with some friends and we made a, a feature length documentary called From Ruins to Ruins, which is about Anglo-Saxon history. And um, as I was doing that, I was growing a little YouTube channel on the side uh, with lower, produ lower quality production than that, that full length documentary from Ruins to Ruins. But the YouTube channel survived the jive, grew and grew and the production quality has grown now that it matches what, a, what we made in that film back then. And um, now the channel's, uh, yeah, got millions of views. Probably it's had about 10 or 11 million views in total over the years. And, I, uh, and I'm combining historical knowledge of, you know, mainly Germanic paganism, Nordic paganism, Anglo-Saxon, but also I have a look at Celtic paganism, Roman paganism, other forms of European paganism that all derive from one common source, that of the Indo-Europeans of the Enneolithic in Eastern Europe. And I use the modern, the most recent scientific methods uh, available to us through the miracles of genetic science to help us to understand some of these ancient peoples, uh, like the Indo-Europeans and the Anglo-Saxons. Um, and so it's, the channel is very much not only uh, useful for practicing pagans to get factual information but also just for history buffs to to get information on the latest sort of findings in um archaeogenetics and uh and archaeology yeah it's always i always find it really interesting the way the way you can trace everything back kind of through linguistics and dna and archaeology to kind of connect all of these different um ancient cultures that kind of all have similar mythological motifs or customs and things like that. And it, it, your, your work definitely presents it in that kind of scientific way, in a way, if you're talking about DNA haplogroups or things like that. But when I'm watching your videos, I, I always think about like how 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 humans might have some kind of genetic memory because I've never been to Europe but I have European ancestry and sometimes when I'm just even seeing like scenes of the land and and anything on that channel I just have this like deep deja vu or or deep resonance with with the that imagery and it makes me think you know there there's something in our blood maybe that's that's storing these memories cuz it's so far back. You you cover things that are going into like the Neolithic ages, but it 
it's somehow all really familiar when I'm seeing all of that. Absolutely. I, I agree. I mean, you can't make, if you, if you keep a zoo, you can't keep the animals happy unless you replicate the habitat, which they came from. So that, that's the only, otherwise it causes them enormous stress. Um, they can go mad, the, the poor creatures. So, you know, there's something hardwired in their genetics. It doesn't matter if you take the tiger out the jungle, you can't take the jungle out the tiger. That, that, that we have a, a sort of affinity with the, the environments that have shaped us. And uh, it's very, I mean, maybe one day science will understand the mechanism that causes this, or perhaps it's beyond science. Perhaps it's something metaphysical that ties us to these places. It's, it's something that will, will never be explained. But whatever it is, I definitely agree that it's, it exists. Yeah, and you you mentioned the Indo-Europeans, and that's that's something that you cover a lot on your channel. Um, basically, you know, the thing that comes to mind with me is I have Lithuanian ancestry, and I've seen the I've seen Sanskrit with the Lithuanian language like next to each other, all these words, and it's like almost the exact same language. So that's right. that's crazy to me when I'm you know going to a yoga studio and hearing, you know, a little bit of Sanskrit here and there, but then being like, that is such a, an exotic, distant culture. But m when I, if I were to actually learn Lithuanian, like my grandparents spoke that, it's almost like the exact same language. So could you briefly kind of, um, you know, describe the um, the spread of that proto Indo-European culture throughout Europe and then into, you know, all the way into India, because that's where the name comes from? Sure. Well, I should stress first, the name Indo-European just is, was given because it was the name of the language family, not of the people, or mm -hmm. it didn't, they hadn't even said there was a people. And the language family was just named by its Western and easternmost extremities. So it was, it was as far west as Ireland and as far east as India. But now we know that there are other further, more east. Since, since then, we found further eastern Indo-European languages in the Tarim Basin in China. Um, but anyway, it's called Indo-European. The Originally, it was linguistic, that, that linguistics that, you know, about back in the late 18th century, f people figured out that this, this common origin of all these languages most of the European languages and m many, uh, and also Iranian, uh, and also many of the languages of India, uh, specifically North India and the um, the uh, sacred language of Sanskrit, which is their, uh, you know, it's like their version of Latin for Catholics. But they all come from a common source, and now we know that that's because they all, there was one common, you know, a group of people, a people um, uh, who's heard of a genetic you know, identity that can be traced and that spread with the languages. They lived in Eastern Europe, uh, just north of the Black Sea, uh, north of the Caucasus. They, uh, f just at the end of the Neolithic and uh, it, throughout the Bronze Age, but that was when they started to spread out. Um, but they didn't spread in all directions. They mainly start spreading westward uh, towards the Danube and, uh, uh, you know, around Northern Europe. Now, what DNA testing from since 2015 when there's been some great advances in genetic science has shown is that people north of the Alps like northern Europeans speaking very broadly like everyone from Slavs in Russia to you know Celtic speakers in Ireland have more DNA from these Indo-Europeans than people on the southern part and that could be for a variety of reasons. But ev everyone in the southern part speaks Indo-European languages. And most of the people in the northern part speak Indo-European languages too. Uh, the only exceptions in Europe are the, the Basques in Spain, the Hungarians and the Finns. But all the other languages are Indo-European. What happened um, over the Bronze Age is that they dominated. And that's why if you're from you know, Lithuania, good half of your DNA comes from these people. But... Uh, what, what, when they went into Asia is a little bit more confusing because early on there was a, a migration eastward at the beginning who, instead of where everyone else went west. But that migration eastward became uh, an ancient language in China called Tokarian. 
and they were isolated from everyone else for a long time out there. And it's possibly associated with an ancient archaeological culture called the Afanasievo culture. But many people think that the, they also, someone went south into India, but that's not what happened. They didn't go from the steppes where they, the Indo-Europeans originated into India. The Indian migration, or what's historically been called the Aryan invasion, happened much later. And it's very much associated with the area that we call Lithuania now, that region of the world. People notice that in Indo-European language families, you have you know, Germanic languages, Romance languages, that's ones de derived from Latin, Greek, uh, you have the Celtic languages. But th these three, three languages are especially related to each other in a way that is quite shocking. And that's the Slavic languages, the Baltic languages, meaning Latvian and Lithuanian, and the Indo-Iranic languages, some people call the Aryan languages, which includes Iranian and Sanskrit, Hindi, Urdu. Now, why would those have a specific affinity? That's a bit funny because one's in Eastern and Northeastern Europe and the other's all the way down south of the Himala Himalayas. The reason has been determined that, the, um, that once the Indo-Europeans were established in Northeastern Europe, there was a region uh, associated with the uh, archaeologically called the Fat Yanavo culture, and that uh, is where it sort of broke up into three sort of... There, there was an, a language there of a people, of people spoken, which is not Proto-Indo-European, but something later, that was ancestral to the Baltic languages, the Slavic languages, and the Indo-Iranic languages. And some of them, uh, you know, became the Baltic languages, like Lithuanian, and stayed put there. And another branch of it, they, they went back southeast into the steppes where the, in, their ancestors had lived long before. So they left the forest of Northeast Europe and went back onto the grasslands of South Russia where their ancestors had previously lived. And then from there, they went further east again, all the way to Central Asia on the, across the steppes using chariots, which they invented. They were the first people to invent chariots uh, about 4,000 years ago. And then by a, about three and a half thousand years ago, they invaded India. And that's why you have the sacred language of Hinduism, which is Sanskrit. And that's why the gods of India, Hinduism, not all of them, but the oldest ones, the ones you see in the most ancient Hindu sacred texts, the Rig Veda, have very strong parallels to European gods. And even their names are often cognate. You can see, especially looking at uh, Lithuania, they have, you know, Indraja, where they have Indra in India. So that, that's basically the, the short story, but it's a, a covering thousands of years of history. Yeah, that's really fascinating. And I'm wondering what, sh what you have to say about, um, you know, this, this Aryan invasion that happened in India. You know, when I think of Indian history and culture and stuff i immediately think of the vedas and how those are still relevant today like a lot of people are reading the vedas a lot of people are into yoga and just the, the whole eastern mysticism in general and it 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 kind of perplexes me a little bit that these indo-europeans kind of brought they developed something like the vedas after this invasion that you're talking about when they're going east. But that seems so different from, you know, like the the runes or, or things that are going on in Europe from the same root culture where it isn't, mm. it doesn't really have the written tradition or it just seems so different. I see that I totally, you know, see the connections and I see that they are from the same source, but what do you have to say about kind of the way that the written culture of the Vedas developed from these Indo, Indo European people? Well, it's definitely the product of syncretism. In fact, even runes are the product of syncretism in some respect, because I mean, Germanic runes, probably don't even begin until about 2000 years ago. They don't get into Scandinavia, certainly until about 2000 years ago. Germanic culture had existed and continued to exist for a long time after the runes were invented as a non-literate culture. As 
And that means that they sang their song. They had sacred songs. They had sacred stories. They had bards singing these sacred stories. And the same thing existed among the Celts, where they had, uh, you know, very honoured bards who were, you know, at the at the, you know, the right hand of the king, who would sing the legends of gods, the legends of heroes, and the legends of kings. And that's important to get on the right side of them. And these songs and law the, the the law of their ancestry and of their gods was sacred it was like their prayers and so it it was memorized verbatim word for word and people would spend their whole lives learning these things and so they could be enormous enormous like uh, as long as the rig veda the rig veda existed in india for a long time without a written form it was it's it's been dated based on the language to roughly the time the Aryan invasion is dated three and a half thousand years ago but there is no way it was written three and a half thousand years ago there was no that we have no evidence of that but what, what it probably was is originally it just I mean, it certainly was based on oral traditions um that that merged uh took to form the Rig Veda and the the, the the form that we have it written down now about three and a half thousand years ago. However, the stories within it are even older than three and a half thousand years, some of them uh, dating all the way back, you know, to, to the Indo-Europeans and you know, the Neolithic. And that's why, um, so then you're talking like 5,000 years. And this is all preserved without writing. And we, we, might, we come to the, we come with the Western bias now, which is not just a Western bias, but a bias that exists in many societies that, in a pre we say pre-literate which is a very presumptuous term but we you say illiterate non-literate cultures are inferior to literate ones because literacy is a superior technology it seems well the indo-europeans from what we can tell from the celts and from the aryans believed the complete opposite to be true the celts for example it's i think it was herodotus who was writing about the celts they had a 20 years study that required necessary for the for someone to become a druid 20 years of their life devoted to it if they wanted to become a religious authority and they forbade the writing down of any of that knowledge which they considered would degenerate and uh, defile that knowledge the only writing he he write, he says that the only writing the celts engaged in was greek and they only learned to read and write greek because that was so they could interact with greek culture and learn a bit from the greeks but as for their own celtic heritage they were would they were forbidden from writing it or, or or sharing it in any way the aryans in india similarly considered the writing of in it of holy law to be a sign of decline a sign of the degeneration of ages that is part of the hindu religion you know we move in their religions from a golden age into a darker, darker age. We're now in the Kali Yuga, which is an age of confusion. And this need to write things down is a sign of that, you know, the evil of the age. So when the Aryans, who were in, entirely uh, you know, pastoralist people with, uh, whose lifestyle was based on horse riding and driving cattle across the vast grasslands of uh, Central Asia before they came into India, they came into contact in India with an urbanized, very, uh, very populous area or with cities and literacy. There were already cities and uh, people writing in India. And there was presumably, though we don't know much about it, uh, th there was this Indus Valley culture with sites like Harappan in, um, in Pakistan. This undoubtedly had an influence on the Aryans and the two cultures combined in such a way that uh, the Hindu religion as we now know it started to take shape and writing of uh, religious law became an acceptable act. Um, similarly, something must have happened in Germanic culture because the runes are themselves derived from Etruscan uh, and the Etruscan alphabet is itself derived from Phoenician alphabet. And the Phoenicians were Semitic and the Etruscans were not Indo-European, but they were some kind of Southern Neolithic European based language they spoke. So this is a, a Southern influence on the North uh, when you start to get literacy. Uh, and that that's what, whenever we see Indo-European cultures with writing, whether it's the Greeks or whoever, that that's because of 
near eastern influence to some extent the phoenicians or someone has uh has had that influence in the case in india it's not the phoenicians it's the um the uh, indus valley culture yeah that was another thing i was curious about you know when i'm when i'm imagining this map of europe and and asia and the indus valley and the spread of the indo-europeans and their invasions and stuff who uh, it's kind of a dumb question but like were were they were they always invading a pre-existing um culture that was not indo-european like even in the european cases well it's hard to say and it's um it's somewhat difficult to go by with just archaeological information uh, and genetic information. What the genetics shows is that there were um, massive population replacements. For what seems to have happened is, I mean, everyone in everyone in northern Europe still has about half their DNA from the Neolithic Europeans, and everyone in the south of Europe has even more. Uh, you know, up to 75% or so still from the pre-Indo-European peoples. Yet the languages were still changed in the South as well. So we can sort of guess how that might have happened. But um, but the, it's important to note that the Neolithic blood that people have in the North of Europe is not all from the regional indigenous Neolithic peoples across Northern Europe. Most of those disappeared nearly all of the Neolithic blood that we have, where, wherever we come from in the nor- north of the Alps, comes from the f- from only one of the Neolithic cultures. That, that's the globular amphora culture, which was sort of around Poland. So it mm. seems like what happened is the Indo-Europeans spread westward a bit into Poland and mixed with these Neolithic people to form a new culture, which is generally what we call the corded ware culture. And that, that corded ware culture then proceeded to expand everywhere and just kill, or, or if not kill through murder and warfare, uh, perhaps through um, disease, spreading diseases, or perhaps it just outcompeted them from superior, you know, outbred them or, or had better farming techniques. I think some kind of massive tragedy did occur like you know for the neolithics but for example in britain the 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 indo-europeans who who came into britain four and a half thousand years ago were called the bell beaker culture and they had you know this mixture of court they were corded where derived you know got that globular amphora neolithic dna from poland mixed with the steppe dna from um the uh, the proto-indo-europeans and they uh came to britain and within a couple of hundred years or so 90% 90% of the DNA of the people has been replaced. So that's an enormous replacement. So some people will say, well, there's no evidence of mass killings. We, we can't find pits full of bodies, which is true. But uh, I mean, do we really need to find an actual pit full of mass to, to, of bodies to prove a massacre? Maybe they just left the bodies out to rot. They didn't give them burials if they didn't give a damn about them. Who knows? Or maybe there was a, a there, there is evidence that the there is certainly evidence that the proto Indo Europeans carried the plague. So it is possible that they, as they expanded, spread the plague with them, and this helped them to conquer uh, because the the the, the disease ra- ravished the, the the populations that were preceding them. Uh, there's also the po- p- potential that you know there were just empty parts of land, and also there's as you were asking before, like not all parts of Europe and Asia were equally populated so when the in the bronze age when the aryans are going into india that's densely populated but you can't expect that when the indo-europeans invaded scandinavia they were encountering massive cities uh, nothing of the kind they were they weren't meeting as much as many people and that's partly why people like the scandinavians and the lithuanians have such a high amount of indo-european dna because there weren't that many people there before the indo-europeans so there was more mixing. And, uh, you know, I mean, if, if when they went into highly, you know, den- more densely populated areas like Crete, for example, in Greece, was had cities long before Indo-Europeans got there. And 
Cretans today don't have very much Indo-European DNA, but they speak Greek, which is an Indo-European language. So you can see something, something similar in Greece happened as in India, whereas up in the north, something very different happened. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Um, as, as we're kind of looking pretty far back at this point of the conversation, I wanted to, to ask you your thoughts on kind of the theories or mythology that these people, the Indo-European, Indo-Europeans or Aryans or whatever you want to call them, had may, maybe would have come from some fallen civilization like Atlantis. Because I see that flying around a lot out there. I was wondering what your thoughts are on you know, lost civilizations or lost origins before we we can trace their movement and everything? Well, obviously there are gaps in the archaeological record and we don't know everything about everyone who's existed. We're finding new things out all the time and it's always fascinating. And I've no doubt that some of the, you know, great marvels of ancient civilizations have been lost and perhaps some of them will be discovered. So it isn't completely crazy to believe in lost civilizations to an extent. However, um, I, I, th- I approach these theories with caution. Atlantis, I do not believe existed. Plato is writing within the context of the Timaeus and Critias, a philosophical treatise that is meant to communicate a moral message uh, and a valuable one about the seeing your culture and your people in the context of enormous stretches of time and, you know, that old adage, this too shall pass. So no matter how, you know, that this is an Egyptian telling an Athenian, while, you know, once upon a time, you Athenians had this great civilization and it's completely gone. So, you know, it's kind of humbling and it's kind of a reminder and it's a useful reminder uh, for us even today. But it isn't an actual historical description of an actual place that existed. Uh, that's not what we're seeing. Um, and uh, that's a mistake. Uh, so so that, that's how I view uh, Atlantis. I uh, certainly don't connect Atlantis to the Indo-Europeans. Um, the Indo-Europeans would not have a culture that you would... The term civilization is loaded. What, what, but certainly I think how most people define it, which is cities, literacy you know, systems of currency and taxation, this kind of thing. They didn't have that. They, uh, they had a, 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 a very tribal-based, um, warlike society based on predation of neighboring cultures, uh, where young men would go out and raid uh, neighboring cultures and bring back what they wanted, women and, and booty. And that uh, cultural tradition of raiding carried on all the way to the Vikings. That's where it comes from. Uh, And Odin himself is a god of this raiding culture who derives from an ancient Indo-European tradition of like this wolf cult of young men becoming like wolves, going out, leaving society to go out and live like beasts and prey upon other humans. Um, That's what we're seeing. And I don't think that's, when we say civilization, I don't think that that's what most people mean when they're talking about civilization. So, uh, in that sense, no, the, the Proto-Europeans didn't have a civilization. Uh, I also want to just clarify that I, I use the terms Indo-European and Aryan to mean two different things. The term Aryan has in the past been used uh, interchangeably with the term Proto-Indo-European uh, to refer to the, you know, the Neolithic peoples on the steppe who are the Proto-Europeans. I don't call those the Aryans because... Aryan is uh, an Indo-Iranic word, so I use the word Aryan to refer to the Proto-Indo-Iranic people who migrated from the Fat Yanova culture in northeastern Europe down into Central Asia, where it became the Sintashta culture, and then from there into Iran and into India. But I don't refer to the Proto-Indo-Europeans as Aryans. Right, that makes that makes sense. You were kind of describing their tribal lifestyle, their warrior lifestyle. I'm interested in kind of what their world was like. You know, I I see the warrior culture is super emphasized 
even when you're looking at the religion, it seems like sacrifice is really emphasized. So could you kind of paint a picture for that kind of really harsh world that they inhabited and how that kind of turned into their paganism? Um, well, I mean, they're going to... What we can say from the proto are you talking about the proto Indo Europeans here? You mean? I, yeah, I, I'm I'm still focused on kind of the original like culture that seeded all of these other cultures. You know, the kind of the the earliest versions of it. Sure. Well, interestingly, looking at their health, they are very healthy for the time. They are. There, there was a study. I think it was in. 2015 2016 it showed that they had uh genes associated with reduced cancer risk genes associated with much more uh, greater associated with height and uh with better digestive health and all kinds of uh different collections of genes associated with better health so if you compare them to the people living in neolithic europe they would have been taller stronger and healthier um in fact, even today in Europe, the prevalent, the amount of Proto-Indo-European DNA, or sometimes called Yamnaya DNA, in association with the Yamnaya uh, archaeological culture, correlates or very strongly with height. So the the more uh, of that DNA you have, the st- the more likely you are to be uh, very tall, with some exceptions. The um, these people then were not uh suffer they weren't suffering the same effects of a of of the neolithic revolution that had begun in the middle east and spread out through alitalia and over into europe where people suddenly went from hunter gatherer lifestyles in into uh suddenly there were now intensive farming they were devoted to repetitive labor of flint napping uh, dig, plowing land, sowing seeds, constantly maintaining their, you know, their cattle, their, their settlements. And, you know, they're fixed in one place, uh, sedentary lifestyles. These guys on the steppe did not have that. They did take on farming. They had wheat, uh, but they, it wasn't like the, you know, the be all and end all of their life. Like it was for people in, the Near East and Europe, who really depended on their wheat harvests. These guys were the first people to get and spread the genes of lactose persistence, lactose, which is what makes you lacti- lacti- uh, lactase persistence, or which is what causes lactose tolerance. It makes you able to drink milk. Now, cows were farmed in Anatolia and you know Europe. And milk was harvested, but the people couldn't drink milk. They would have just made cheese from it because they didn't, they couldn't digest it. But some of the Indo-Europeans, not all of them, because it was still quite a rare gene, but it started to get more and more common over the Bronze Age, had this gene that lets them just drink the milk straight out the others. And the amount, uh, a bodybuilder will tell you, milk is super food for growing muscle mass. It makes, it makes you grow so well. It was great for your bones, great for your muscles. It, it's just designed to turn a little calf into an enormous bull. So it works the same way on humans too, but if you can digest it. So this was a massive genetic advantage as well as they're also having genes for being tall and uh, generally being strong and resistant to diseases. They had then a patriarchal culture, their their linguistics shows us and the genetics shows us. The linguistics shows we can tell they're patriarchal because they have words for like a bride price, you know, and they have evidence in for the language from reconstructed language showing how they would a woman would be moved from from one family to another and a man would be the established family, which is what the tradition has been in the West ever since. And then when we look at the genetics, we see that's uh, reinforced by the spread of Y Hapler groups and maternal haplogroup so maternal haplogroup comes from your mother's line so from your mother's 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 mother all the way up and the y haplogroup comes from your paternal line father's 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 father so the haplogroup phylogeny is the way they spread out shows that what we're seeing is a reduction in diversity in haplogroup phylogeny uh, y haplogroup um 
white hat groups and that that's because there's some really super successful clans or men starting off with one guy then becoming his family his clan his tribe and then it becomes you know suddenly entire swathes of europe all have the same haplogroup. group um and this but the same thing is not true for the female side so m- some people speculate whether there were more matriarchal societies before the Indo-Europeans. That might be true in some cases, but dubious. But it certainly is not true after they come because they were very patriarchal. So then we also can tell about that. So they're hard guys and, you know, they're tough, they're big. They could, they, they, their, their whole life is centered around their cattle and moving their cattle around. And when they want to move their cattle onto new land and they find there's some people there who farm grain, they probably don't give much respect to them. They probably just burn it down. They probably kill them if they can. And uh, they just use that land to graze their cattle. And maybe they take the women as uh, hostage and then marry them or add them to the, you know, the collection. Uh, that's kind of what we're looking. That's what the Hapler groups are showing. That's what the evidence seems to indicate. The raiding culture, though, is, uh, is an interesting phenomenon because we see it in, obviously, the late Viking culture, but there's evidence from much earlier uh, cultures, you know, like ancient Greece and Rome and other parts of Europe, which have been documented by uh, the historian Chris Kershaw in her book, The, uh, the One-Eyed God and the Indo-European Menabund, um, that shows that you know, kind of like if you've ever seen the movie 300, where it talks about the Spartans, where they would, a young man would just be sent out and chucked out into the wild and he had to survive on his wits. Young boys, Spartan boys had to fight with animals. They had to um, live off stealing. So it's like if they got caught stealing, it was still illegal, but they would still be you know, punished by, under the law. But at the same time, nobody was allowed to give him food. So the only way he could feed himself the boy is to steal so he has to learn to become wily and live like a wolf and this sort of this has been re uh this has been traced all the way back to the indo-europeans where they had this kind of wolf cult where it's not quite the same thing as warriors and armies because an army implies you know a standing force of men who are trained uh as as a as an army and who are paid as soldiers that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about smaller groups of men who are led, they're starting off as boys who are led by an older man and live outside of society and they don't pay anything. It's just literally you live on what you can steal. So they're like what, not warrior bands, you can put it that way. You could also call it pirates or something like that might be more accurate or, uh, you know, they would basically this you know the family people have big families and they'd acquire land but they'd never have enough land for all their sons so some of their sons would go and join these bands and then these bands are the origins of many of the nations of, of the different races of europe romulus and remus is basically you know there's two boys raised by a wolf and then they establish rome this is a a, a, a mythological way of telling about two men who part of a raiding party who just acquired this land and then found a new dynasty and similar stories exist elsewhere in Europe. So what they're, what's happening is you're getting the sun, these guys, young boys going out raiding, just coming across a settlement and they're going there to just steal. But very often the people are like offering them stuff to try and ask them not to, not to burn everything down. And sometimes these guys are being made the Kings and just, they're just saying you, you can have our society, just don't burn it down. So instead they're taking over it and taking positions of power. So that's, that goes some way to explain how the Indo-Europeans spread so much and so quickly, because they didn't always replace everybody in an area, as I, as I said. So why were they accepted as the leaders? Why did their languages replace the pre- preceding languages? That, that, those are the questions we have to try to answer. And this is this seems to be the most reasonable explanation it was this culture of raiding young men young male raiding parties that there's no doubt that the, the spread of indo-european languages and dna was male mediated yeah and so you were saying that this this culture this um practice that young men are doing was connected to odin 
Yeah, well, that's a later thing. So the god Odin is derived, you know, Odin is what they start calling him about a, th a thousand years ago, or roughly. Before then, he was called in Scandinavia Wodens. And obviously, and Wodens comes from an earlier thing, proto-Germanic god called Wotanaz. And Wotanaz is, you know, maybe around 2000 years ago that, that he starts, his cult's getting really big. But Wotanaz is uh, the god of the raiding party. His, his name means like a fury or frenzy, an ecstatic raid. And like his men, his like warriors are called Ulf Hedner, the wolf headed or berserkers are the ones who go into this battle rage. They get like possessed by this spirit of war itself. Like, and they wear the skins of animals and they, and they, uh, you know, terrify their enemies and just uh, fight without fear of death because they're led by the, this God who is, the ruler of an army of the dead. So even if they die, they carry on fighting for him in the afterlife. So this cult is very, very ferocious and it uh, helps to instill a, a sense of, um, a, you know, bravery and courage in, in young fighting men. Um, and I, and it, it doesn't seem to have been a Germanic invention. It seems to be something, it just seems to be derived from something much older that, you know, an ancient Indo-European god of an unknown name um, who was the god of the uh, of the warrior war band of the Menabund, or the Comitatus? Some people call it, or the Corios. Yeah, that's interesting because I'm not really an expert on, let's say, Norse mythology or paganism. But I, my uh, idea of Odin is maybe not so warrior like, but more kind of wizardly or um intellectual because i think of odin as you know kind of sacrificing himself for knowledge and things like that so i think of him more as like a um a holder of secrets or like a holder of wisdom so can you can you say anything about how he evolved from more or I, maybe i'm just interpreting this wrong but kind of the difference between Odin as like a warrior deity versus kind of like a wisdom deity? Sure. Well, first off, I, I don't think he was the God ever of war of warriors in the conventional sense. Well, he was, it was eventually, but I think originally he was just this God of the raiding party, which is different from the God of battle or, you know, like a, a, a traditional soldier. It's these raiding things. And, um, that you know, what happened obviously over the course of a thousand years from the sort of roman times uh with the increasing influence of the roman military on germanic life is that like many many germanic people were serving in the roman army and introducing customs from the roman army into germanic culture not by the way germanic includes scandinavia that is germanic um the uh the result being that this sort of cargo cult of, of, of the Roman army survives long after the fall of Rome among Germanic pagans. And it had been associated with this God who was previously of these, of the war band. But as the, um, the most rich and aristocratic and, you know, famous men in that society uh, were then, you know, gradually more and more the guys who were heading these, the military, uh, and uh, on these um, Germanic uh, war bands, which were, were by that time structured according to uh, what they had learned from the Romans, from, from Roman, from the Roman legions, the god so suddenly became more prestigious and wasn't just a god of raiders or Vikings, but a god of the aristocracy. And as literacy entered as well, the Germanic culture as a result of influence from the South. This God also became the God of the runes and he took on many other roles until he eventually became the God that survives uh, in Icelandic medieval literature that we know as Odin, who is quite uh, dynamic and mysterious. And he's a wizard obviously, and he's a, a God of wisdom and of, of runes of, and of secrets, esoteric knowledge and of the aristocracy he is the the god of noble blood so all the 
you know, most of the kings are are claiming descent from him. That's not just the the Viking Norse kings, but also English kings would claim descent from Woden. So this is something that um, this was an ongoing process over the the first millennium, uh, and uh, I, so I think your your perception of Odin is correct uh, because you, you've based it on what we know about that god from the the late pagan sources. But as as I'm sure you're aware, in all religions, they can change a lot in a thousand years. Yeah, definitely. It's it's really cool to just kind of paint that picture of you know how this kind of warrior raiding culture just spread everywhere and then how a deity like that can can evolve over time um it's really cool when you can connect all the different deities across the map as you know say like connected to the indo-european sky father or the indo-european earth mother like gaia type deity could you go into the like the roots of those kind of basic deities that we find scattered all over the globe yeah i'll give it a try well the one that comparative mythology and comparative linguistics uh allow us to try to reconstruct some of the the first gods of the proto-europeans and see which ones derived from them Comparative linguistics is a very, it really relies on actual, uh, you know, a scientific method of charting the sound changes to see whether two words are what they call cognate, which means that they come from a common root. Um, comparative mythology is a, a more recent discipline, which not everyone holds in as high esteem, but it is a discipline and it is a, a legitimate a- academic practice where you look at myths and see similarities to them and try to t- see whether they, why they're similar, whether it's because one influenced the other or whether it's because both come from a common source that's lost to us. And you can usually figure it out and uh, because it, whether it's plausible if the two have influence on each other or not, for example. Um, so it requires, you know, looking at everything, archaeology, genetics, everything. But um, the most well-attested gods of the Proto-Indo-European pantheon that are agreed on are the Sky Father, the Storm God, the Divine Horse Twins, and the Dawn Goddess. And there are quite a few others, but people will always argue over them. For the, when it comes to goddesses, the problem is that Indo-Europeans seemed very happy to adopt gods and goddesses from other people wherever they went. Uh, the Hittites, for example, in Anatolia were known as the people with a million gods. And uh, India, Hindus Hindu sometimes say that they have innumerable gods or millions of gods. But the, the Hittite gods, you can see that a lot of them are Semitic pagan gods that they've just adopted from their neighbors in Mesopotamia. Um, and some of them are their original Indo-European ones, and sometimes they're syncretic gods. And the same thing is in Greece, but when it comes to goddesses, it seems like adopting a local goddess was the rule rather than the exception. So most of the time, when we look at goddesses in Indo-European religions, we're not looking at Indo-European goddesses. We're looking at goddesses that were there before the Indo-Europeans and which were incorporated into. That's interesting. It might reflect what I talked about earlier their patriarchal attitudes and how they would come into an area and just take the women for themselves so maybe they took the goddesses and gave them to their gods metaphorically speaking but um there are that's why the earth mother goddess who is present in most indo-european religions is widely agreed not to be of indo-european origin but rather an anatolian goddess whose origins came in uh Anatolia with the invention of farming and is related very strongly to later Mediterranean goddesses like Kibali, uh, uh, Ceres, Demeter, uh, these kind of farming crop goddesses, you know, and you see them elsewhere in other religions. In Germanic religions, you have Frigg and Erko, etc. I talk about that on my channel quite a lot. I made a film where I went to Anatolia and looked up, tried to find the origins of this earth mother. 
But the Sky Father, who she inevit- she usually is uh, marries or is raped by or some has some kind of congress with him. He is an Indo-European god, and he's probably the most well uh, co- one we can confidently say existed. And he seems to probably have been their main god as well. Um, his name was in Proto-Indo-European, although you'll forgive me if my pronunciation is incorrect, but uh, nobody knows for sure anyway how it was said, but something like Dios Pater. And that is that means literally Sky Father. And his name is exactly what, uh, in, in India they had a god in the Vedas called Dios Peter, which means the same thing. And of course, in Rome you have Jupiter, which means the same thing too. And that's cognate also with Zeus, uh, or Zeus in Greece, who's also known as Zeus Pater, Sky Father. Now, Jupiter and Zeus are Sky Fathers who have retained that quality of the original Proto-European Sky Father God in the sense that they are fathers of, other, of most of the other gods and also kings of the Pantheon. However, they've also absorbed a lot of the elements of the, the Storm God, who is normally agreed to be a secondary god. Uh, Georges Dumézil was a, an early pioneer of comparative mythology, and he called. So, therefore, we call this the second Dumézilian function because there's the he has like assigns functions to these different Indo-European deities. Uh, the Storm God uh, is normally a secondary deity, but he's become the primary. He's been mixed with the primary deity in the in Greece and Rome, whereas in Scandinavia, the Norse pantheon, Thor is very clearly the storm god, a secondary deity, whereas the the main god, uh, Odin, whose name is not a cognate with Skyfather, but who clearly is the Skyfather in the sense that he's married to an earth mother of sorts. He is the father of many gods. He has the, all the attributes of the Skyfather when you use comparative mythology. So sometimes you have to use comparative mythology and linguistics like you can with the case of Zeus but sometimes there's no linguistic parallel but you can see a clear mythic parallel in the form of the Norse example. In um, the Proto-Indo-European storm god was called something like Perkunos or Perkunos and that sounds almost exactly like the Lithuanian storm god they still have is Perkunos. It has hardly changed his name. So uh, that's very interesting. Uh, and it's even become in Finland, a non-Indo-European speaking country, it's become a swear word there because they use the, the word perkele to mean the devil. And then the devil has become a swear word that they just shout perkele when they're angry. Mm-hmm. Um, the, uh, the, the horse twins are the sons of the Sky Father. And they are the they are widely seen as being also having some kind of romantic relationship with the daughter of the sun or with the dawn goddess in various uh, different myths in different areas. In India, they became the Ashvin twins. In Gre- Greek Roman religion, they became Castor, um, Castor and Pollux or Castor and Polydukas. And um, in England, they became Hengist and Horsa, the, the horse twins who founded the English race. Uh, they're usually seen as progenitors of a dynasty. That's why a lot of people also believe Romulus and Remus are the Roman versions of them in some way. So you've got two horse riding boys. Sometimes they're even not just horse riding, but literally have the attributes of horses, like horses' heads or something. And they uh, establish a new line of humans, which is connecting that, those humans to the Sky Father, uh, for, you know, genealogically. The Dawn Goddess is an exception to the rule I said earlier about the Indo-Europeans always adopting native goddesses because it does seem that they had a Dawn Goddess of their own. And rather than being like an Earth Mother, she appears to be more like a sexy, promiscuous, uh, alluring sort of, rep, you know, symb- symbolizing a more... Uh, a, a, a sort of threatening almost socially threatening sexuality um but she's also uh 
you know, married off to some other God in some context, or she has to be rescued in some context as well by an opposing force, a rival, a rival group to the, to the gods in, of whatever kind. In Norse sources, you have the giants who steal even. But uh, the, the dawn goddess doesn't really exist in the Norse sources. We, but we try, generally, I think it's a good argument. I've, I've supported that some people have made that, that Freya, the goddess who is, you know, certainly a sexual goddess of the kind I described, is the equivalent of the dawn goddess. But we do have a Germanic go- dawn goddess in English called Estra, which is where we take the celebration of Easter from, and Ostara, uh, in Germany, and then in La- you know the Mediterranean, they have Aurora, and the Lithuanians have Aushrin. Uh, they're all cognate linguistically: Easter, Aushrin, Aurora, Eos. And in Vedic India, they have Ushas, who is the most um, most invoked goddess of the Rig Veda by far. She's the most important goddess back then, and she's the do- goddess of the dawn. So the dawn goddess used to be really, really important in the proto-Indo-European religion, but for some reason, in every subsequent religion, she's become less important. Um, but she, she's there, and uh, yeah, she's she, the linguistic. She's one, one where we can really clearly see the linguistic cognates are there, but the mythic cognates sometimes get a bit mixed up because those get assigned to different goddesses. And then it seems like goddesses have a tendency to multiply, uh, if you know what I mean, or divide. Like one goddess can suddenly become three or four and over, over thousands of years. And then suddenly they've got loads of goddesses and you have to guess whether they all came from one or two or whatever. So it gets a bit complicated. Yeah, that's all really fascinating. I didn't, I don't think I knew after watching a lot of your videos, I don't know if I ever caught that, that the the goddesses were sort of from the indigenous culture that the raiders were kind of conquering. And it immediately made me think of uh, the the way in which like Catholicism has so many different Virgin Marys for all these different cultures. And even, even like when they converted um, Mexico, like Guadalupe, uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe was like a whatever happened from my understanding is that conversion or that miracle happened near a sacred site of one of their original goddesses. So that might just say something about goddesses in general of any culture. But when you were talking too about the um, the horse twins, because I did see that in one of your videos. That really struck me too, because I think in one of your videos, you were talking about that mythology of the horse twins being connected to the bull or having like a sacrifice of a bull. And that immediately made me think of the Zodiac where Gemini, the constellation, shows the twins. And I I think Gemini shows Castor and Pollock, Um, but that's right next to Taurus the bull too. So it's crazy how... (laughs) all of these things kind of reconnect at the end of the day. Well, that's very interesting. It's certainly worth looking into. I, I don't know so much about uh, the Zodiac stuff. I know that it was a big thing in Rome and uh, I, I didn't even know that they associated Gemini with Castor and Pollux, but it seems reasonable that they would. Yeah, definitely. Um, so when you were talking about the gods that are, consistent throughout these different cultures that have Indo-European roots. What can you say about the idea of sacrifice? Because you talk about that on your channel just as like a general thing with modern paganism, but um, what can you say about the importance of sacrifice for these cultures? Sacrifice is the central uh, basis of paganism basically it's the it's what the whole religion is um they didn't have i mean if let's say even calling it a religion is so obviously f- very problematic and in fact we're talking about if anything multiple religions and even then you could also say that calling them religions is not really right but the the traditional re- religious practices that existed around europe were all based on sacrifice and that principle was 
it didn't exactly die with Christianity because Christianity is also based on that principle. Jesus sacrifices him in himself for us as an atonement for uh, our wrongdoings. And we participate in that sacrifice if we're Christians through communion, uh, the rite of transubstantiation and the consumption of flesh and blood uh, of his flesh and blood that you consume the sacrifice. That's all, that's what we've always done. So just in the other times we'd kill a chicken and cook it and eat it. And then that's your sacrifice. So very often the sacrifices were actually eaten by the people, which seems cheating, doesn't it? If you're giving something to the God, how come I get to eat it? But uh, any of your listeners who have fam are familiar with Hinduism in India, they'll know that there's this sort of puja you get. Uh, you give some, you give offerings and prayers to the gods, and then then you share in those offerings with them. And in the process, you are blessed by consuming like that ball of sweet rice they might give you, and that 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 actually means that you've benefited from it rather than stealing the food that you've given to them it's not like that at all it's rather you give them something and then they give back so what this sort of cycle of giving and taking is essential for understanding their religions and even the proto indo european the words for give and take were uh, related almost the same word i think it's very complicated to to understand for us because they had this entire universe view of the whole cosmos which was ba based on the principles of reciprocal giving and receiving you would go on a raid you'd take stuff but you would give all of it to your lord when you got back and then your lord would give it back to you he'd you know you see uh, it's uh, just like in viking raids they'd take everything back to the yard and he'd give it back the same thing with the gods you, you can see it in greek uh, in the uh, in the Iliad or whatever, you know, they, they, they slaughter the ox on the beach, then they roast the thigh bones and the fat, and it, they, they throw the fat and uh, the, the, the thigh bones onto the fire to burn as an offering to the gods. And then the rest of the meat, the best bits usually, uh, although they say that the best bits are the bits they gave to the god, they eat the rest and they're, and they're then blessed by it. So, you know, it's best of both worlds. You get to share food with the gods and you, you're blessed by it and you also get a nice meal. So that's this. Uh, this is how their entire religion was seen. There was, if you want something from the gods, you need to give something to the gods. And although there were later developments, uh, philosophical developments uh, in the Mediterranean, namely like uh, Neoplatonism and subsequently in the theurgy uh, of the sort Jamblichus preached, which justify sacrifice as a as, as a pious and good noble activity for pagans but in a different on a different philosophical basis because they say that you the gods don't need anything it's uh, they say it's metaphysically absurd to say that the gods want you know you to kill a chicken they don't need it why would a god need a chicken it doesn't need it but that it's pious and and uh, morally right to do that anyway but um but nevertheless, the, the, the original pagan view seems very much to have been that the gods will bestow favors upon you if you offer them things, uh, even though certain later philosophical schools dif disagree with that. So you have now people calling themselves pagans, but if they're not offering sacrifice, then it doesn't really make any sense to call yourself that because that is literally the, the defining point of the religion. The, the whole, even if you're not offering blood sacrifice, in India, for example, vegetarianism seems to have taken off very much after Buddha's time, perhaps in the time of Ashoka the Great, who was himself a vegetarian king. So in the last 2000 years, India has become majority vegetarian. And then, of course, blood sacrifice is no longer preferable or fashionable. In fact, it becomes abominable. Uh, yet the principle of sacrifice exists perfectly well in India in the form of incense offerings flowers fruits offerings libations of milk and um of water even but uh the original sacrifices of the indo-europeans would have been cattle goats mead which was the alcoholic drink which 
remained of, of sacred significance even later to the Celts and the Baltic people and the Vikings and all sorts. Mead is always very p important. And then later when wine gets introduced to Indo-European peoples, then wine is very good as a libation in ancient Greece and Rome. They pour wine for the gods. And blood sacrifice remains important for a long time, animal sacrifice. Uh, but, you know, it, whatever your beliefs are, as a, if you're a practicing pagan, if you don't want to sacrifice an animal, fine. But you still have to sacrifice something. You have to. And if you don't, then you're not a pagan. I don't know what you are, but you're not a pagan, that's for sure. Yeah, that's that's really interesting. And and now that we're kind of talking about modern day pagans and modern day paganism, I'm wondering if you can um, speak to your own practice or your own experiences with it. Um, I don't know if you have any like if you've had any sort of supernatural or mystical experiences with these gods or what you kind of do for sacrifice or what, what does your practice look like for you these days? Hmm. Well, I won't go into details about experiences, but I'll say this, that I'm happy with my life and I have much to be grateful for. And I thank the gods for any blessings I receive. So I've been a practicing pagan for a good, 10, 11 years now, I can't remember. And things go well for me as a pagan. I make sure that I offer prayers of praise and the praise must not be sponta just spontaneous, although sometimes it is if I haven't prepared anything. The daily prayer, I have a daily prayer, which is very, very simple. I only pray for achieving a higher level of consciousness, nothing else. And uh, I, I invoke and uh, praise to God specifically for that, which I say every day and with uh, accompanied by a hum very humble offering of a, of a lighted candle, which I leave to burn. That I do on a daily basis and don't consider it uh, excessive. There is a risk of excessive piety in paganism. It's said in many cases Odin's wisdom, the Hovermore, specifically says better never to offer sacrifice at all than to offer too much because it's not seen as the right thing to do in that culture. And all pagan cultures have this, cu this sort of ideal rather of being moral or immoral, as you see now in Christianity and Islam. They have the ideal of being upright, being respectable rather than being dubious and not upright not what not the done thing so it's based on pride and shame rather than you know um guilt so when i when you have in rome they had the distinction between the religio from which we take the word religion and superstitio from which we take the name superstition superstition meant to do more than is what, what than is necessary, to perform more sacrifices than are necessary. And these were considered by the Romans to be a bit womanish, a bit foreign. If you were doing it, it was likely that you're not right in the head. If you're doing too many sacrifices, you're just not normal, you're not respectable. That's superstitio. And um, it's associated with foreign cults like Christianity. That's superstitio. That's, Christianity is a superstition from that perspective. But um, from my perspective then, I don't go over the top and don't do too much. My, I have some people with whom I worship and we calculate according to the positions of the moon uh, at specific times of year when to perform, the, which are most auspicious for us to perform our sacrifices and offerings. And they are very infrequent and the prayers are formulaic. And I made a video specifically explaining how you can make your own prayers. You don't have to always use an attested ancient prayer for it to be effective. But when you look at ancient attested prayers in the European religions, you see that they all follow roughly the same formula where the gods are invoked first, according to traditional epithets, which, um, according to the attributes that are attested in mythology, you know, so you could call Thor, like, you know, the, the 
slayer of the serpent or something like that you know so you, rather than just saying hey thor like if you're talking to some guy in a pub you invoke them with grand epithets the grander the better and then you you explain why uh they are the god that needs to be invoked at this moment for what you're asking for and then you ask for what it is you want and then um that's it really and the idea that someone would pray without asking for something uh, as if that was a good idea is not uh not pious at all that's superstition you always if you think you don't need anything then you're delusional you always need something so asking for something is part of being pious and it's part of this um culture of giving and receiving it's not only wrong to ask too much it's also wrong to ask too little you have to ask for things if you need them and you have to be willing to receive them and you mustn't ask for too much so it's this uh, everything is done according to a balance and you, you're never doing anything over the top and you're always maintaining the traditions in a very conservative way uh, that's how that's how i see it and that's how my colleagues see it yeah i really like that i'm um it's getting me thinking if you i'm wondering what your thoughts are on kind of modernity and where where this type of neo paganism can fit in and maybe i don't know if you have any critiques of the world we're living in or any thoughts of how a pagan practice like this could maybe be an antidote to some of our modern day issues or problems i guess i guess my question is just like where are we at right now in the world given all that you know about history and do you have any ideas on how we can use paganism to make things better for ourselves sure well my complaints about the times that we live in are too numerous to list so but i'll say that all traditional religious paths are a potential antidote to the problems that people face these days and they can be the source of great consolation and uh i i i always commend anyone for choosing to take a religious path whatever that path may be even if it's one i do not follow um i do take some make some exceptions with that because i only am talking about traditional religious paths and um in some although i'm chosen not to be a christian i don't believe in christianity i think that some of the people who reject christianity do so for all the wrong reasons they have acquired uh, a worldview and an ideology through cultural osmosis of the prevailing attitudes of our time that they are, have you know been introduced to from their teachers their parents the television the radio the pop songs they listen to and when they find that christianity doesn't match with them then they consider that christianity is not a suitable religion that is the wrong approach entirely there's only one reason legitimate reason not to be a christian if you have been raised a christian and that is that you do not believe that jesus is the son of god and the savior for mankind and all the rest of it that that's a legitimate reason the, if it doesn't if 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 you believe that and then you find that your political ideology doesn't match with christianity then it isn't christianity that needs to change it's your political ideology um but people who want to find then a religion that they consider will correspond more naturally with the values they've acquired in the modern world who then look to paganism are looking in the wrong place because it uh if they look closely they will see that it doesn't it would not work at all you would not be able to introduce the concepts that people now consider to be morally right uh to people in ancient rome to people in you know on the steps it just wouldn't uh, be acceptable uh they were they were just as traditionalist and just as uh, conservative as any christian but they just had different taboos different things that they considered to be pious different things they considered to be impious 
So, and I think that's often the way that you find that some people do look to Buddhism or some Eastern tradition for the same reason. They think that Christianity is too bigoted. So they go to become a Buddhist. And then when they spend some time in the East, they realize that Buddhism isn't what they thought it, they would, it would be and what they hoped it would be, which is basically an excuse for them to do whatever they like, which is not what any tradition is. All of them require the moderation of your behavior to suit a, a dogma, a system of laws and rules and restrictions to which you must uh, adjust yourself. So um, that uh, is my gripe with neo-pagans. I think a lot of them inst are inventing a religion to, that will m to make it fit with the modern times. But it's the wrong way around. You, you have to fit the times to match the traditional values of your religion, not your religion to match the times. Yeah, that's a really good way to put it. And do you have any, any thoughts on what you think the most prevailing religion is today not not necessarily like an actual religion but what do you think is the most mainstream common um philosophy that that we're experiencing in the modern world right now uh, well the what i see everywhere as like filling religion is the absence of belief in a way or the the kind of delusion pure delusion where everyone is completely deceived by everything around them and doesn't tr even attempt to see through the veil we, we it's like um not almost atheism scientism atheism not not i have nothing against science i i uh, love science i could say but i science is just a practice a discipline for measuring you know a phenomena in the material realm it doesn't tell you anything more than that and the wisdom of so many cultures of ancient cultures has always been that the material existence we see is is evidence of one that is superior to it so when people stop looking for that and and trying to interpret the world according to the evidence of a higher superior meaning to it then that is uh, i think a very bad time that's a it's a sign of a, a very serious decline for humanity so i mean you, you deal with astrology that that essentially holds that the the influence of the stars on people's lives in the future can be measured and and it, it implies uh you know the hand of a god or of some intelligent creator um which is good and i'm glad that um astrology is still popular with so many people uh and other and other kinds of things like this might be making a comeback that's great but um the the opposing force that's growing with such strength is just a belief in nothing which results in a manic frenzy for scrambling for resources like maggots in a bin, everybody wanting money and uh, what, not really having any reason or any philosophy behind their life, anything deeper for, the, for, the, for their motivations other than satisfying the most basic human urges uh, or animal urges, I should say. Yeah, I, I definitely am sensing that. Just the, uh, the mob mentality... Um, and to close out this, this, uh, line of questions, do you think, do you think we're in like a, a serious civilizational decline because of this? Like, are you worried that our, our civilization is on the brinks of, on, on the brink of collapse or anything like that? Um, well, Yes and no. I think that I don't think it's that good idea. It's not that great an idea to. I guess. Do you want to 
there's a really loud plane going over. I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of an ominous. <laughs> if you had an ominous answer, that would be appropriate. Um, yeah. Well, they're going to drop the bomb and just end it all for once <laughs> yeah. and for all, and fine. But um, the the um, I don't think it's a good idea to worry about things that you can't change. I'm not exactly a stoic, but I, I think there's some wisdom in the stoic perspective. But the the our culture is in decline. But if it is, it's it, it's because it it's meant to be. Uh, everything happens as as is fated uh, in my belief system. Fate is predestined to a large extent. Although an individual man, woman can alter their fate through the strength of their will. Uh, you know, and acting, enforcing their own will on the reality around them. They can change it and steer it to a certain extent. But, uh, yeah, whatever happens, I think it's always best to, before you pour out all your energy into worrying about the state of the world or the civilization, just try to focus on the state of yourself. If you, and make sure that you can keep your thoughts and emotions and well-being uh, up to scratch and as, as functioning as, as properly as you want them to, as, as you think they can be. Because uh, I think actually living vicariously through like the you know po- famous public figures and constantly engaging with the world as like this stage that we experience through the media is very very destructive for people's well-being and it it distorts their perception of reality whereby they consider very important events that aren't actually important to them at all and then completely ignore events happening in their actual lives to people they know which are very very much more important but that that's one of the effects of the modern mass media technology that i that i consider to be quite dangerous but uh yeah, we're we're in, we're not in a great time, but that it's always best to look in perspective and try to focus on what's important. Yeah, I like the idea of stoicism, and even stoicism itself kind of emerged when Rome was slowly in a decline too, and when bad things were happening. But astrology, at least Western astrology that I practice, actually has like a really stoic perspective as well especially if if you go really deep into the study of it and be like this bad thing is happening now this bad Mm -hmm. thing is happening two years from now you can and you're just aware that bad things are always happening and to take a stoic approach is the best way to to deal with it um Mm. so i have one yeah exactly um this has been a really great conversation and I'm glad I got to just like fire a bunch of questions at you after kind of binging your channel for the past few days. Uh, so thanks a lot for coming on. I have one final question that I've been thinking about as I'm talking to YouTubers who are really putting out really impressive work. Do you have the intention like like when I'm thinking of the the phenomenon of like really good content being put out on YouTube, are, are you trying to ever get on like TV or get on like a, an old school platform or something like the History Channel? Or are you more kind of trying to just create this independent thing and build it up from there? Because I'm, I'm always, when I see really good stuff, I'm like, you guys should be on the history channel, but then I'm kind of like, this is just better than the history channel anyways. So what are your thoughts on um, that type of media and the, the, the way it's being distributed these days? Well, that certainly was my hope when I started out the channel and, you know, when I made from Ruins to ruins in 2013, I was making it then I was hoping it would get broadcast on television I have had several interviews with History Channel for different programs. They called me up and interviewed me for them. Um, The last one, last time I spoke to History Channel was in 2019, but they never put me on anything in the end. And 
in the if if they had, it wouldn't have made much difference to me anyway because uh, I have I I have friends who have had um, television series. Um, you know, I know people who've been on TV with multiple their own series history cha- series on in Britain, and it's you still got to afterwards keep going. You've got to sell books or have a YouTube channel or something. So it's only like a temporary thing. If even if I did get on television, it wouldn't be like a permanent fixture right uh and the youtube gives me more freedom and i can make what i i have more say and don't have this whole team of people telling me different ways that it should be done it's just me and um if the channel keeps growing i'll be able to hire people to help me and uh, eventually and then i can make it better and I'll still have it my way because they'll be working for me. So the incentive for me to really want to be on television is 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 reducing all the time. And I think that uh, as the baby boomers start to die off, television will suddenly find itself a lot less relevant than it used to be. Yeah, that that's what I'm thinking these days is like, yeah, it, it's uh, it's sort of like there's there's not that um, prestige that it used to have because even even if say you were on the History Channel on a show or something and you'd hit up all your friends like hey check out the History Channel like how many of your friends don't have cable these days it's it's just mm-hmm. it seems like that form of media is really <laughs> dying fast so it makes me excited for people like you who are putting out tv quality stuff but it just happens to be on on youtube yeah i hope that that that's the future but in order for that to be people have to make money i i can make a living off of it now what my youtube channel i couldn't when i started it. it took years to get to this stage but uh i only started having a patreon account in 2015 and it took a long time before i got anywhere near that i could live off of it but then though that took years of week doing weekend work you know working on, on the side of my job on in the evenings after work doing the channel at weekend giving up my weekend to work on the channel and finally i get to the stage where i can quit my job and just do this but uh, i still don't make a lot out of it but i think it's increasing more and more because more and more people are understanding that if you want good content you you should pay for it, something and if you're gonna pay for something why pay for you know, Disney Plus or Netflix or something, when you can pay specifically to content creators who make exactly the kind of content you want to see. And you and that that cultural change has been happening over the last five years and it will continue. I think people will get more into that and it will become, it's being normalized uh, as, the, as the expression people use, um, that people are now used to the idea of paying content correct creators directly for their work. Uh, so that's promising because it could mean that you see ever increasing quality of content on the internet uh, and less and less power uh, you being like concentrated in these legacy media institutions. Yeah. I, and it makes me excited because there was that, there was that kind of in between period where it was like, there's not a ton of great original content on YouTube and history channel is showing like, ice road truckers or like really (laughs) crap shows so i think we're kind of getting out of that hump and i'm just like okay now i can go on youtube and there are these channels that are gonna deliver basically what the history channel and discovery channel used to deliver but for a while it was just garbage so i'm excited for uh for your page and pages like yours to keep um educating us because i find it fascinating and like i said in the beginning when i watch your stuff a lot of the times i have this like real visceral like holy shit like this i know i know what that was all about i remember that or there's something in our genetic memory or something that makes it really intriguing and entertaining i'm so glad you said that dan yeah that's that that really makes me pleased to hear that my my work is uh affecting people that way especially the lithuania video i really liked that one because i was that was i was like damn i i know what it i i can feel it I, i've been there even though i've never been there so i really recommend going to lithuania it's a wonderful place really great country 
Yeah. Well, thanks a lot, Tom, for coming on. This was great. Um, for our listeners, can you share uh, where they can find out, you know, about your channel and your work and anything else you want to share about what you're working on? My YouTube channel is called Survive the Jive. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, Survive the Jive. Uh, my most recent video, some people say my magnum opus has just come out. It's part one of a two-part series on Anglo-Saxon paganism. The first one is very long, but it's, uh, it took me two and a half months to make, two and a half months of research and editing and everything. And it's about the gods of the Anglo-Saxons. And part two, which I'm working on now, is going to be about the elves and orcs and other things that they believed in that weren't gods. Uh, so those two together, people seem to be very pleased with. Besides my YouTube channel, I also upload videos to BitChute and Odyssey, alternative video hosting platforms. But I also make lots of posts on other social media. You can follow me on Instagram and Facebook and Gab. Um, and I, yeah, I make quite a lot of posts on Facebook, so you can keep up with me there. Or Telegram. If you use Telegram, I do have a Telegram channel. So all of my different platforms have links to the other ones. So if you find one of them, you'll find the others. And uh, please go out there and uh, check it out. O also, that for those of you who don't like watching videos, especially long ones, I do upload um, most of the videos as a podcast form. So you can just listen to them in the car. And that podcast is called Survive the Jive. And it's available on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, all the normal podcasting apps. Nice. I didn't know you had a podcast form of it because I listen to stuff all day at work. So I'll have to subscribe to that. Well, thanks again, Tom. This was great. And I'm really looking forward to sharing it with, with my audience. So thank you. Thank you for having me down. I hope they enjoy. Thanks, guys, for listening to my interview with Tom Rousel of Survive the Jive. Make sure to check out Tom's YouTube channel full of educational videos that are very interesting and relevant if you're into paganism, I would say. Um, follow me on social media. My Instagram is at cosmic underscore keys underscore podcast. Twitter at cosmic keys 777. If you want to book an astrology reading with me, you can email CosmicKeysPodcast at gmail.com. Um, Five-star reviews are always appreciated on iTunes. Definitely helps the show grow, and your listenership is even more appreciated when there's a review to go along with it. Yeah, I'm uh, realizing, you know, we are in the thick of Mercury and Pisces season because I'm having very Mercury and Pisces speech problems lately. So recording this outro is even a little bit of a challenge, but uh, enjoy the Martian action-packed few days we've got coming up. Enjoy the Venus Kazemi and the Venus activated full moon in Libra. And I will talk to you all next time. Take care.